Well, I have exactly 11 a.m. Um, and we, we had about 30 people sign up, but you know how that goes. Yeah. That maybe, maybe we're good and could get started. Um, Tori, I see you're at the beauty shop. So glad you're, you joined us and your beautician. <laughs> this is me the happy hour. So Kathy is the only one I see with a bottle. Kathy Bailey has a bottle with her. Patty has a cup. Um, oh, Marie has a bottle. It looks like water, but we know there are other adult beverages that are clear. Bob <laughs> Kelly has one. Okay, here comes Dara. Okay, I'm gonna wait till 11.01. And okay. then I think Russ, I turn it over to you, correct? Okay, so, all right, welcome everyone. I have 11.01, here we go, Russ. <laughs> Well, thanks everybody, and and uh, you know, please drink up. <laughs> uh, I met Mark Moss. I don't know, probably eight years ago at the Wilma. I think it was at the Wilma. Uh, it was sold out for one of his "Tell Us Something" uh, presentations, where he worked with um, eight or so people for some period of time to help them perfect their storytelling skills. It's an amazing evening with each person coming up and. Uh, giving a, a six, eight minute discussion uh, story about something personal in their life based on some, I don't know how Mark does this, but some strange little topic like uh, you should have been there or I almost had it. <laughs> um, and you could see him running around, walking around with this great hat that is Mark's signature. And uh, everybody knew it was storytelling time. Mead has been lucky enough to uh, enlist Mark's services, and uh, a few of us took a five-day course and helped us learn a little bit more, uh, in my case, a lot more, about how to tell a good story. Um, we're going to, I think three or four of us are going to speak today and give you an example of what we learned in a very short time. We're hopeful that because of, a, of another good grant, we're going to be able to offer this course to more MEDA members. Um, but uh, let's let's let Mark tell you a little bit more about what he does. Thanks, Russ. Um, and I don't remember meeting you that night. I meet a lot of people, and usually during that during that course of that night, there's just I've got a lot of balls to juggle, and um, and it's a lot of fun. And by the end of it, you know the adrenaline is gone, and um, I'm ready for that scotch. Which it's 11 o'clock, so I'm not drinking scotch right now. Um, at every Tell Us Something event, I tell people that it is important to actively listen to each other and to join together and support each other to share stories. Um, I tell them that this is your community and this is, these are your stories. Um, at Meet a Happy Hour, I want to also add that it is with our stories that we can reach people with our mission. Um, I would say leave the graphs and pie charts at the office, um, leave the data sets for an email, and really share your story from your heart. Because when you reach someone through your, their heart, you hit them in the brain and they're going to remember your story so that when it's time for them to take out the checkbook or sign that bill into law, or whatever it is you're trying to convince them of, they're more likely to remember what your story is and why the work that you're doing is important. Uh, last month, around 20 or so Meta members joined me every day for a week, as Russ was implying. We had two hours every day, and I taught them what I know, what I know about story structure and sharing stories and some of the skills required to be a good storyteller. Um, I tailored the workshop specifically for MEDA members, and I do that with every client that I work with. You have um, a group of people that you want to help improve their storytelling skills. I'll meet with you and get really an understanding of what you want to accomplish, and uh, I will tailor the workshop specifically for you. Um, today, four of those workshop participants will share their stories with you. And after they have shared their stories, we will have an opportunity for questions. You can ask me questions 
you can ask them questions um, and we'll have an opportunity for what I hope to see as a lively discussion. Um, and I just realized. All right. Um, usually a tell us something event is focused on a theme. We hadn't discussed a theme for today's happy hour and listening to the stories, uh, I kind of started to feel like there is a theme that was developed. Um, the common theme, you can call it, why am I here? Call it why I do this, call it passion. You'll see that these storytellers are personally bonded to the work that they do and their passion really comes through in the stories that they share. So I start every Tell Us Something event off by saying you came to listen, let the listening begin. Our first storyteller is Gloria O'Rourke. Gloria has been a MEDA member since 1995 and self-employed since 2003. She and her business partner, Mike, share an office and have been married for 44 years. Mike and Gloria enjoy spoiling their four grandsons and then returning them with sugar highs to their parents. Please welcome Gloria O'Rourke. Do you know how many sticky notes are in a pack? We all use them, but do you know there are 100 sticky notes in a pack? I go through about a pack a week. Why? I'm self-employed. That means I'm my own boss, right? Wrong. I have a contract and I work for MEDA, which stands for Montana Economic Developers Association. MEDA has a membership of about, as of this morning, 253 people. And that means I have 253 bosses. So at my desk, here at my desk, I like to think of myself as the communication hub. Maybe a federal partner or a state partner has an urgent program update and they'll send it to me, Gloria, can you shoot this out? And, or maybe a meta member will send me something saying, hey, we're putting on a training or, oh, we have this to offer small businesses. Would you shoot it out? So I send it out. Or maybe I'll get a phone call and it's a business person saying, eh, I'm trying to start a business in Bozeman. Do you know who I should contact? And so I look at myself as kind of the communication hub. Things come in, I send them out, right? But I'm not always at my desk. One of my favorite things to do is what's called a meet a community review. Um, once, how it works is a community will invite me to in and I'll first start with a small team of maybe just three or four of us. And what we do is we listen. We listen to a community for hours. We listen to them share about what's important to them, what problems they're having, what challenges they're having. And uh, we summarize everything that we heard from these hours and hours of listening. Then we go back to our desks and I start tapping the shoulders of some of those 253 bosses. And I say, hey, I mean, this, this town needs help with small business finance, or this town needs help restoring a historic building, or this town needs help with manufacturing, or this town is looking for a co-op for a store. So then we work together to help that community take action on their action plans. A perfect example of this is the community of Lockwood. Several years ago, Big Sky Economic Development and Beartooth RCD invited a small MEDA team to come in and listen to Lockwood. And so we listened and we listened and we heard three main pretty heavy burdens the community of Lockwood had. Um, one was they felt like they were the ugly stepchild of Yellowstone County. They felt their voice was not heard. Another one was they realized they had a large dropout rate, that they had these kids that grew up in Lockwood, went to school in Lockwood, and then suddenly it was time to go to high school, and they were shuttled to different schools in the big city. The third 
major problem they wanted to address, and it was quite tragic, was they had several deaths in their community because people had been killed. There was no safe streets, no safe sidewalk, no good lighting for the people to walk on. And so the team, after we listened, we came back to our desk, we tapped shoulders of those 253 MEDA members. Um, we worked again with Big Sky EDA and Beartooth and we held a huge town hall meeting. And as a result of that, our, our MEDA members bringing their expertise to the table and local people of Lockwood stepping up. I'll never forget this young dad stepped up and he said, I want my boys to be safe when they walk to school. So the people of Lockwood came together and they really went to work on their action items. So a few months ago, we were back to Lockwood and we wanted to hear what happened. And what we learned is Lockwood has incredible momentum now. They no longer feel like the ugly stepchild. They, um, through working through legislators, they changed state law so that they now have had the right to vote on to whether or not to build a high school in Lockwood. And they now have their own high school. And uh, best of all, they were the first community to pass a levy to pay for sidewalks and streetlights. And so this huge momental, monumental shift has happened in Lockwood. So back at my desk with my, my <laughs> oceans of sticky notes, I've realized something. And that is that there is no self in self-employed. I can't do it on my own. And I like to think you can't do it as well without me. And so working together with my 253 bosses who really aren't bosses, you are really my partners, working together, we are making a difference in our communities and building a great place in Montana for people to work, play and live. Thank you. So muted. Thank you, Gloria. Um, our next storyteller. Are you ready? Um, you is. I lost her. There she is. Um, our next storyteller is Heather McCartney. Um, she is a world traveler from a small town. Heather McCartney is a fifth generation Montanan and works as outreach and consumer education specialist with the nonprofit Child Care Research Resource and Referral Agency, Family Connections. Her passions include hunting for good decaf, long reads, and connecting people to great resources. Residing with her in Shoto are her conservation officer husband, artistic and whimsical daughter, five freeloading chickens, three cats and a dog named Bear. Green is her favorite color. Please welcome Heather McCartney. Thank you. I am driving down 89. The sun crests the eastern horizon and the light is blinding. So I pull my visor down, push it to the side. No need to start a migraine this early in the day. Light flickers off the refuge waters. As I look in my rearview mirror, my little passenger looks dreamily out her window. Look, Mama, I see a dragon, maybe a dog. I follow her gaze into the puffy clouds. Uh-huh, I see what you see. I also see a blue heron fishing over there. Do you see it? Yes, and pelicans too. She leans her head back. I am tired, Mama, she murmurs. Me too, sweetheart. Why don't you pull your pillow over to the door and have a little nap? She settles herself against the seat, ponytail flopping over as she leans into her pillow and pulls up her blanket. I count myself fortunate to live here on the crown of the continent. Our little bungalow sits in a tree-lined town in the shadow of the Rocky Mountains, the backbone of the world. The front, as usually known, is a cornucopia of flora and fauna. On a given day, you'll see silver-tipped grizzly bears grazing on black choke cherries next to freshly mown hay fields, next to mountain streams that water an otherwise arid plain. In the town of Shoto, 
The deer regularly grazed down my sunflowers and the elk bugle at the city limits. Neighborhood children play from house to house. The schools are top notch. And as Garrison Keeler would say, all the kids are above average. 60 miles later, I pull into a quiet neighborhood. Slowing to go over a speed bump, I see a lively elementary school around the corner and gaze wistfully at a for sale sign on a modest home. I stop as Clara gathers her backpack and hops out. I meet her on the other side of the car. We kiss through our masks. Love you, mama. Love you too, Zugs, I say as I squeeze her in a hug. I climb back into the car and stare at her back and she heads into someone else's capable hands. 15 minutes later, I pull into the parking lot in my company designated space. As I turn off the engine, I feel the heat of the day coming on. I hate my commute. I hate all the hours lost to transition when I'd rather be relaxing, catching up with friends, heck, even doing chores. Anything but sitting in a car, my back and legs getting tight. I hate that Clara is strapped to a seatbelt for those same hours rather than running with the sun on her hair or climbing into a treehouse to exchange secrets with friends. I especially hate that because my commute to childcare is so far and high quality care is so expensive that I will have nothing to show for my eight hour day plus two and a half hours of travel. My entire paycheck will have been cashed into making sure my daughter has great care and learning while I work. Yet I'm doing exactly what I love. I'm an influencer for positive change. I'm deeply gratified helping people solve problems and communities rally around solutions. Like you, there really isn't much I wouldn't do or haven't done to help these good developments along. I mean, you know the drill. Cups of coffee at community tables, op-eds to regional papers, sitting on boards, volunteering for anything on a Saturday, and then biting your tongue as a group moves in a different direction, leaving your hard work in the dust like beer cans after a rodeo. But this, this depleting of my personal resources to care for my child so that I can help other families and communities care for their children, this is pulling at me like a tension wire, fastening me to two worlds, professional and personal. Sitting here in the August heat reminds me of the pressure cooker I'm in. I desperately want Claire to have a carefree childhood full of rich experiences. And I'm also eager to work to help solve Montana's childcare crisis. I'm educated and employed and I'm at risk of leaving the workforce. I live in a childcare desert and I am digging wells for other communities and their childcare oasis. Last night's call from a panic provider wondering how she'll finance next month's expenses haunts me. Families are desperate for childcare so they can work uninterrupted. Yet with pandemic variables, many have pulled the kids home, taking precious cash flow with them. If she can't put together financing, she'll join the 10% that have closed their doors this year, adding to the already 40% shortage we had in the state. Last week's blowback from a county commissioner's meeting, asking them to allocate funds to develop childcare, that had me ready to quit. Hot tears stream down my face. Why don't people want to support families? Would they rather not have staffing at hospitals, kids in schools, volunteers, or even tax, tax dollars towards infrastructure? What the hell am I doing fighting for others that they may enjoy high quality, affordable, and available childcare for, for which I've not attained for myself? This is fraying the very fiber of my being. I am driving down 89 as starlight illuminates the last of the night grazers. My view is framed by oncoming headlights in the highways. Still slumbering at home, Clara dreams of her day at school, full of friends and learning. Her dad and dog will walk her down the idyllic fall boulevard, kicking leaves and stopping to pick up her favorite rocks. And what am I doing? Like you, I'm going to work. Thank you, Heather. Yeah. Thank you, Heather. Our next storyteller is Russ Fletcher, an old retired guy who escaped from San Francisco 25 years ago to live in Missoula with his retired attorney and wife, Alexis. They have two children. His son lives in San Francisco and works for Google. 
His daughter has come home from Los Angeles and works for Hulu. Russ spends a lot of his day looking at a computer screen, drinking coffee, and pondering the future of Montana. Please welcome Russ Fletcher. Thank you, Mark. I want to call this uh, how I found my last best job in a Missoula dive bar. <laughs> it was a dark and stormy night 20 years ago. There was a waiter listlessly clearing dishes from the table where the 10 or so people that I invited uh, to dinner uh, had finished eating our greasy burgers and drinking Bud Light. I'd invited them there to ask a single question, something that I'd found since I'd moved from Silicon Valley. It was what the prison sheriff on Cool Hand Luke stated when they dragged Paul Newman back from an escape attempt. What we've got here is a failure to communicate. Why didn't Montana communicate? We did in San Francisco. It was just me and, and we'll call them Bud and Lou. We were left drinking our last can of Bud. There probably was a wet dog laying by that back door. They had just been shafted by the company that had bought their company. So I was buying them their beer. Ironically, in a couple of years, they would develop a fully automated company that without employees doing about four and a half million dollars a year in sales. They would put a phone in their little tiny office on Higgins that would go to the phone tree of all the services. And Bud had to go in occasionally to sign checks. And sometimes he liked to pick up the phone. So one day he's in there and the phone rings. He picks it up and he hears, hi, my name is Susan Smith and I'm from, and let's call it Giganto Corporation. He immediately slammed down the phone. It rang again. Hi, my name is Susan Smith and I'm from Giganto. He so calmly said, thanks Susan, but we've already got all the computers we need. And he hung up the phone. The phone rang again immediately and he picked it up. Now he heard in a rush, Hi, my name is Susan Smith. I'm with Giganto and we want to buy your company. This time they got better attorneys and sold it for mid eight figures. Now back to that uh, back room with those soon to be multimillionaires. We'd had a few beers and we're getting down to the nitty gritty. We'd all come from techie backgrounds in Silicon Valley. And in that, in that environment, I had always told my employees, please, get out of the office at least an hour a day. You have to get out. You can't just sit in your office. You've got to see what's going on. Who are new competitors? Who might we collaborate with? What's the new technology? I also had told them that if they were over 45, I wanted to them to find a 25 to 30 year old mentee, not a, men excuse me, a mentor, not a mentee, someone who they could work with someone who they could teach, who could teach them about what changes in technology were happening. They had to realize that it was, they were not the future. It, were the, it was the younger people. It's all and still is all about networking. The three of us lamented the fact that Missoula wasn't talking to Bozeman, wasn't talking to Billings, wasn't talking to Great Falls, et cetera. It seemed like they all thought each other was competing. It was the same for Montana's companies. They weren't talking with each other to see where there might be collaboration. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't Montana, it was the world. How could I address this? <laughs> they both looked at me and in very calm and, and uh, humorous uh, gazes said, why don't you just build a website? I was running a company at the time, but I said, hey, let's give it a shot. So I knew two guys, they were brilliant techies, John and Steve, they founded Mod West which was an incredibly successful ISP with I think clients in 56 countries. They agreed to build a website that would become the Montana Associated Technology Roundtable, Matter, because the economy does matter. I'll never be able to thank them enough. Uh, John's now in uh, Truth or Consequences, New Mexico, running a brew pub. So there is a career after technology. The site started modestly. I started holding monthly roundtables, which I'd done in Silicon Valley. People would get together, we'd have a topic or a panel, and people would just talk. And they seemed to be really wanting to, to get, con, get communicating with each other, learn what was going on. I really felt great about these roundtables. They were a lot of work, but uh, I enjoyed them. We had one that I, I think I'll always remember. Uh, the T1 lines was taking 13, 14 weeks to get one installed for a new company. This was just you know, inconceivable. So I said, let's have a round table. 
I got a call from Senator Baucus's office. He said he would like to come and speak because he'd heard about this problem too. When he arrived, he apologized. He said, Russ, sorry, I can only stay a few minutes after I give my little speech. He ended up staying for over an hour as he listened to the challenges of the business community. I would like to think that this event had an impact on him as he announced his first state economic summit a few weeks later. Matters all free, as you all know, I rely on the huge personal satisfaction I get from doing matter, not the funding it generates. It's certainly not the 34 cents an hour I calculated I earned sitting on my butt and answering the phone. While supporters and sponsors are greatly appreciated, I've never focused on monetizing it. In spite of my wife's concern and frequent recommendations that you should be charging for that. To me, it's all about Montana. An example was a CEO I was talking to. Uh, he was having a hard time finding a company to collaborate with. They needed some technology skills. <laughs> I asked him, have you walked across the street? He did. He found the company that fit his needs. <laughs> that company didn't have a sign on the door. They competed for the contract. They didn't get it. But it really showed to me the fact that we really needed to get out of the office and talk to our neighbors. It's been about 20 years of updating the site. I produce three newsletters a week. I talk to thousands of wonderful people. And I have to thank Montana and Mita for helping me enjoy the best last job I've ever had. I hope that if you haven't already, maybe someday in some dark back room of a dive bar, you can find your dream job as I did. Maybe it just takes communicating with the right people like Bud and Lou and John and Steve and everybody at Mita. Thanks, Russ. And uh, Russ is so kind to um, produce the uh, Tell Us Something newsletter on the Mita website as well. So if your inbox is already full, but you want to keep up with Tell Us Something, you can check out the Matter website uh, once a month for the Tell Us Something news. Um, I'm going to push that out today, later. And um, it's got information about upcoming winter once a week workshop that um, I'll be hosting. It's a drop-in kind of a workshop. Um, not nearly as in-depth as what we experienced here with Mita, but it'll be a lot of fun. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention here before we get to our last storyteller is at Real Tell Us Something events, there is no reading of the stories. The only person doing any reading is me. And I, wanted, I do that on purpose because I want to really make sure that the listeners understand there's a difference between a read story and a shared story. In this case, um, obviously that's not what's happening and we all agree that, that it would be okay uh, to read the stories for various reasons. But I just wanted to make sure that we all understand that because it's important uh, when you're thinking about storytelling, you're not probably going to be reading something when you get into somebody's office. You've only got five or six minutes with them and um, you can't be like, hang on a second, I got, I got to pull my story out of my pocket. So when you're thinking about storytelling, uh, be thinking about ways that you can tell your story without reading it. And I'm not denigrating anybody here um, who is sharing their stories, but I just wanted to acknowledge that one difference. Um, our final storyteller is Teresa Schreiner. And please forgive me if I mispronounce your last name. Uh, didn't get a chance to get in touch with you beforehand to, to verify that. But Teresa is the investment director at the Great Falls Development Authority. She's a former butte rat who teases that she came kicking and screaming to Great Falls with her husband. Although she loves to sell folks on the electric city. Teresa just celebrated 10 years with her larger than life husband, Casey, who equally challenges her efforts. Together they have three scrappy and smart little boys that love to give them a run for their money Adam, Liam, and Finn, please welcome Teresa Schreiner. Thank you, Mark. So I'm gonna tell you guys about my dad. My dad has a small business in Butte. It's a dental practice. Although I probably wouldn't call it small because as far as I remember, it's been probably the biggest practice. See, so my dad's practice, let me tell you a little bit about it. It is the practice that as far as I remember, we always had the phone number listed from our house in the white pages. Do you guys remember the white pages? It's the one because my dad remembers what it's like having a toothache growing up. So he would always allow people to call our home. Day and night, phone would be ringing off the hook. 
He's always the one that takes referrals from the police department, the ER, any clinic, Indian Health, things like that nature. So he sees folks of every stripe. He's also not a formal guy, just like his practice. He's unassuming, humble, and larger than life. So people never call him doctor. It's not even Dr. Mike. He's always been known by his high school nickname, Beats. And my dad would always get home later than probably scheduled or he ever wanted to be and later than anticipated. But he would pick the four of us up when he got off work. He'd come rumbling down the dirt road in this old beater of a pickup truck and he'd lay on the horn. It was the signal for the four of us to pile into this pickup truck and go clean the office. So we'd get in the truck, he'd turn around and he'd head on back to the office. He wouldn't stay though, because he would just be dropping us off and he'd head to Doc's place. Doc was his dad. He'd probably go have a beer and they'd rattle off war stories about some toothache that day. And before we'd get out, he'd turn to us and he'd say, nose down kids, ass up. And I remember thinking, that's a strange way to clean because I didn't really know what it meant at the time. But as I'd learn over the years, he'd tell us that all the time, it really meant nose to the grindstone and do the hard work. Now, if any of you have kids, grandkids, or even uh, you know, nephews or nieces of your own, you probably know what it was like when you would arrive back to a scene, leaving four rambunctious children, probably the oldest 10, uh, to their own devices. I don't know what my dad envisioned. I don't know if he was picturing some sort of Mary Poppins scene, leaving the four of us to clean the office, but really it was more like something from One Flew Out of the Cuckoo's Nest. Because what would happen, my brothers would haul out this really large auric orange vacuum, plug it in and start it running. Then the two brothers would start, I think negotiating who was gonna clean. Negotiating would escalate into wrestling. Wrestling would start yelling. And then somehow the two of them would start deciding, hey, let's have, a, let's have a water gun fight. So then they would go into the two operatories or two of the operatories. They would take the dental squirt guns. I think you know what I'm talking about. And then they would start positioning the squirt guns. Water would be splayed out between operatory walls. My youngest sister would be lounged back in a dental chair reading the latest issue of Highlights magazine. Music would be blasting from the laboratory. Usually it was doors. My dad was a big break on through album fan. And I remember myself, really the suffering middle child of it all, always the responsible one, would be clutched holding a broom or a mop, you know, orphan Annie style, just pleading with all of them. Oh my God, you guys help me. He's gonna be back soon. And he'd arrive probably about a half an hour later to the scene and even though everybody referred to my dad as Beats, the four of us affectionately called him Beats a dead horse because he would follow us around the office and he wouldn't give in. He would just lecture us until we got it done right. Eventually we would learn that if we did it right the first time, it would get done faster. And the sooner we actually got it done, the sooner we would be home playing Ninja Turtles or Street Fighter on our Nintendo. Now, me being the suffering middle child, I stayed with my dad on through college and grad school and I worked with him. I remember throughout these years that I was pretty embarrassed that we drove these beater old trucks and all of these old cars. And I asked my dad about it. And I learned that my dad, because he takes patients of all stripes would tell me quite a few things. In addition to the nose down ass up work ethic that my dad has, he would tell me more meaningful things too. He would often say that the banker's spouse takes care of the widow's heart condition. You see, Teresa Beats would tell me that a rising tide does lift all boats. It's not about being the richest man in the cemetery. After all, you don't see a hearse hauling a U-Haul, which is why he takes care of everybody that he does. So my dad instilled in me this work ethic, but he also taught me in this nose down, ass up attitude that we'd better leave this place better than we found it. And my dad also taught me that throughout these years, anytime I was complaining about the social ills of the world, I better be a part of the solution and not the problem. So my dad's diatribe continued to beat through me like a drum, which matters because I think this is why we are all doing what we do. And anytime I found myself progressing throughout a career, if I was unhappy with it, 
I couldn't go complain to my dad because he would tell me, nose down, ass up, Teresa, go find the solution. Don't be a part of the problem. If you find yourself being a part of the problem, go find that solution. So anytime I did that, I'd have to move up throughout this progression. And I continued to ask myself, what is that man behind the curtain? What is that jack of all trades in the community? And I think we all know what it is. It is community development. It is economic development. We are the end of the yellow brick road. And now more than ever, it is personal to me because about seven months ago, my dad actually called me. My dad, who I have seen as this true end of all being, called me at the beginning of the shutdown. And he said, I, I don't know what to do. I'm shut down. My dad hasn't worked with a banker, a personal loan officer, since he'd opened his business. He was nearing retirement. And now my brother, my younger brother, this man who I remember holding squirt guns, was looking at buying out his practice. But my brother had also $700,000 in student loan debt and had a baby on the way. So he didn't know about the PPP loan. He didn't know about the idle loan, wasn't familiar with his succession planning. He knew what I did, but didn't know what I did, quite frankly. So because of the small business center, because of what we do as economic developers, he's been able to safely shut down. He's been able to capitalize on PPP loans and idle loans, secure both of those things. He's been able to actually successfully re-engineer his business and remodel his business during the shutdown and he's been able to restore his business. I can't imagine what would happen without my dad and my brother's practice in the community of Butte. So I want you to remember that. I want you to remember the impact that we have in the state of Montana. So I wanna leave by saying nose down people, ass up. Thank you, Teresa. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to all of our storytellers, Gloria, uh, Teresa, Heather, and Russ. Um, thank you all so much. It's been what a wonderful, what a wonderful morning. Um, we have the opportunity for talk back now. So you can ask questions of me. You can ask questions of any of our storytellers. Um, I'll just turn it over to questions and go ahead and raise your hand if you have any. Um, while we're waiting for questions, Mark, I yeah. could give some folks a little bit of background. Um, there were more than just four of us who went through your workshop series, and some of them are on the happy hour call today. But um, I just like to share that this was incredibly hard work. Um, and because we all watched everybody's story, we've all heard them we, because we practiced, we heard them over and over. And I can't tell you how, um, what a wow it was today to see how we'd all improved. <laughs> so um, I just a little behind the scenes for those of you that might be willing to do this. It was hard, hard work, but worth every minute. Thanks, Gloria. I don't know why. Mark, I just want to tell everyone that presented, thank you, first of all, what, what great stories that you shared. And, um, you know, quite honestly, I think you, you all could sell ice to an Eskimo. So, you know, great job. Uh, you could see the passion in every one of your eyes. And, and that really, I think, helps even move the story on even and make it more um, applicable and, and, and far reaching. So thank you guys, I, I really appreciate it. Thanks, thanks Rick. We had a conversation yesterday with Gloria um, in the um, committee uh, looking at uh, scholarships and professional development and had an extensive conversation about the value um, that both Gloria and I had, had really been able to see in this workshop. And as we look to the future in uh, as economic developers for pipelines and, and funding opportunities that are outside of our real strengths in federal and, and state grant applications and programs and projects, we're gonna be asked to really dig deep 
um, as developers to tell the stories and the, the, the tools and the mechanisms and the reinforcement that Mark was able to draw out of the participants in this workshop, um, I think really um, uh, strengthen the capacity of these um, nonprofit organizations to be able to move to a new level and to tell a different story. You know, we're really good with facts and figures. And today, hearing these stories without a lot of facts and figures, I mean, I'll, I'll always remember there's a hundred yellow stickies because I too use hundreds of them. But um, I, I think it's it's really important. And you guys all did a absolutely fantastic job. Russ, um, thank you for bringing this um, forward as an opportunity um, for me to, to host. Um, and uh, Mark, I, I really think um, we have future opportunities um, to work with you and develop um, this strength in many more MEDA members. So thank you. Thanks, Marie. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun um, to do this. And um, it, it just, I think that for me, uh, what I watched happen and, and no one has verbalized this, but it seemed like there was some surprise from the participants at the amount of work that I was asking you to do and the amount of self-learning that it was essentially happening. I, I was more of a, of a guide than an instructor. And um, the conversations and the discussions that we had helped really shape how the direction of, of how this course went for us. And the, the work and the support that you did in breakout groups, I think was tremendous. And I just wanna acknowledge all of that work. And, and there were people that I worked with one-on-one -on -one, um, who didn't present today, weren't storytellers today, who I also want to acknowledge. They, they did a lot of work. I'm not going to single anybody out, but um, the stories that I saw being shared were tremendous. And some of the stories were really personal and weren't at all work-related. And that is certainly something that is a, a good way to practice your storytelling skills, is just tell personal stories. And then once you get those skills down, you can flip that and get into how to apply those same skills in a work setting, which we just saw uh, four people do in very different ways. Each one of those stories was a personal story. And also um, they each took their version of the story in a different direction. And, and I'm just so grateful to those who were able to do that and, and for this opportunity to meet all of you and um, continue to communicate better, um, not just in my local community, but across the state. One of the things that I recently was thinking about, you know, lots of newcomers are moving into our communities um, and they're bringing their high salary jobs from the companies that they're continuing to work with and for, but we don't have that, those same sort of salaries here in Montana necessarily. And there's always been pushback when we get newcomers coming into the state, but maybe there is a way to welcome them by sharing our stories with them and get them to understand who we are as people who live here in Montana and get them involved in our communities by introducing our communities to them through stories. And once they know who we are and care about us and start caring about the communities that they're moving into, maybe they can use some of their resources to really help uh, move the state forward. That's, I don't, that's not a fully developed idea. It's just one that's been kicking around in my head for the past week or so. And um, I think storytelling is, is a way to change minds and hearts and policies and make things better. As, as I talked about, one of the most important things is communicating. And so many times we get into our bubbles and we don't, we don't share with each other. So I'm, I'm a very strong advocate, and I've talked about this before. Um, we have two very strong entities here in Missoula, one city club, which brings together the community to talk about a topic. Uh, and storytelling is absolutely essential there. The other is tell us something itself. And I would love to see Nita um, collectively or individually um, help get more city club uh, chapters started in Missoula, in Montana. 
as well as tell us something. I think it's, it's, uh, it's the way you can build that community. You can invite those new um, people who moved in uh, to join and to learn more about uh, the character of Montana. Thanks, Russ. So I wasn't able to participate in your workshop and I um, just want to tell you how glad that I am that you did that. <clears throat> I'm an old Toastmaster and I'm an old Extension 4-H agent. So I believe firmly in um, strong communication skills. And as we approach the legislature, um, whenever I've testified before the legislature, I always feel it's important to um, what I consider put a, um, a face on the issue, uh, a face on it. And I always try and tell a story when I'm with the legislature so that they can actually see the face of the people we're talking about. And what you've done here today and what you've showed is exactly uh, what I firmly believe in so strongly. And so I hope we can continue to do this kind of thing. And I applaud all of those who have gone through the workshop as a, as a Toastmaster and doing those speeches and working on those issues years ago. I know how <laughs> difficult it is, um, but you only gain um, those communication skills through practice. I firmly believe, you know, that's why with 4-H and Extension, they start young on teaching them communication skills and, and demonstrations and, and giving talks. So applaud all of you for doing it. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. You know, your, your feedback about um, being telling stories in the legislature makes me think of uh, a little video clip that I remember seeing of Fred Rogers being in front of um, the legislature in, in, on the federal level. And it was being decided whether or not to continue to fund public television. And he just told a story and he, I mean, he was talking to a pretty adversarial crowd of, of people who did not want to continue funding public television. And he just spoke right to the guy's heartstrings, looked him right in the eye and told him a personal story. And the guy was taking his glasses off and rubbing tears out of his eyes and said, yep, yeah, we'll, we'll write the check. Um, storytelling, I think, is such a powerful tool that we can all develop and learn and use in our daily li and professional lives. Mark, I, I too wanna to just thank everybody. Uh, I didn't know what to expect today and I wasn't sure I had the time to do this. And I'm really glad that I took the time to do this because in a week that's been difficult for all of us for different reasons, um, I think I needed this today. And um, as we go forward, I think that the strength of this organization and what we do professionally at a personal level is gonna be enhanced by storytelling. And I wouldn't have said that um, 45 minutes ago. So I just, I just wanna thank you for introducing all of us. Uh, we're all about numbers and we're all about the bottom line and, and charts and graphs. And um, this has been a very powerful hour for me. So, so thank you for bringing this to us. And thank you all for having the courage to, to share those very great stories. Thank you very much. And we're glad you're staying with us, Paul. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm staying on your couch, Russ. <laughs> no, no, I saw your Facebook post. Oh yeah, yeah, that's another story. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sticking around. I'm sticking around. Thank you. Well, what I'll say to that, Paul, is, um, you know, I said earlier in, in the beginning while I was introducing, you know, leave your PowerPoints and your graphs and your pie charts at home. Um, once you've reached somebody through a story, then they're, yeah, they're going to want to know what those numbers are. They're going to want to know the bottom line. If you send that to them in an email, they'll be looking for that email. They'll be waiting for it to open it and, and read that. But if you, if you lead with that, I feel like you've already lost them. And I'm glad I picked you up uh, as a believer. So thanks, thanks for your commentary, Paul. My only disappointment is we didn't hear Jim Atchison in his toolbox. <laughs> 
We'll work on that. Maybe the next meet a happy hour, because we're going to do this regularly. I'm not saying every time there'll be storytelling. Um, that's totally up to meet a members to decide what they want to do during happy hour. Um, but um, yeah, I think we can pick on Jim next, <laughs> next happy hour. If you guys have not ever been to a coal board meeting, um, you know, I have the pleasure of meeting with him quarterly at a coal board meeting. And every time he asks for funding, he has this whole uh, drama situation. I mean, if you want a story, ask him about the time he uh, brought uh, the, bro uh, the broadest people in for the swimming pool. And we had kids in swimming suits and grandmas in swimming suits. And um, he knows how to tell a story, that's for sure. <laughs> awesome, I, I would love to see him share a story at a, at a meet a happy hour Sunday. And I hope I continue to get invited back, maybe just as a guy who gets to listen, because uh, that, that was pretty fun. <clears throat> well, it's 11.50. If yep. It's okay if we end five minutes early. Um, any wrap up comments, Russ? Shall we call this happy hour, happy 50 minutes? I think that's fine. We've all got things to do. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, so much. Um, I hope you do get some time to relax and uh, enjoy your weekend. I know it's about to get cold, at least here in Missoula. So thanks, everybody. And uh, I'll see you on the flip side. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Great job. Mark.